I'm Marianne Howie. Um, I am uh, from New York and I am at LIJ where uh, I work as one of the APDs as well as the Director of Faculty Development. Um, and I am super excited to welcome to Cord Connects along with my co-leader, um, Dan Egan, who's in Boston. Um, uh, Dr. Adamakos is uh, an award-winning emergency physician and leader in the world of academics. She's the Vice Chair of Education at the Metropolitan Harlem Emergency Medicine Residency and uh, NYMC School of Medicine and on the Board of Directors of the All New York City uh, EM Committee. For those of you who don't know, it's, uh, it's a connection between many of the New York programs that then put on academic um, uh, conferences twice a year that are just absolutely fantastic. And if you haven't seen them, you should. She lectures frequently nationally on a variety of lecture topics, specializing in code management, and diversity and equity in medicine. And today we have the pleasure of hearing her speak about creative approaches to dealing with microaggressions on the path to leadership. I'm gonna ask if, uh, I think at this point, everybody's fairly familiar with Zoom, unfortunately, but we are. Um, if you wanna put questions in the chat section as things go along, and I think what we'll do is we'll um, uh, talk about the questions at the end, and I'll work on moderating those at the end. So thanks so much, and uh, uh, Frasso, feel free, it's your turn. Thank you for the very warm introduction, Marianne. And thank you everyone for being here. I really appreciate the support and I'm excited to talk about this topic. So the topic is creative approaches to dealing with microaggressions on the path to leadership. And let's get started. I think a lot of people, when you hear the topic or the discussion about microaggressions, you kind of feel like it's Groundhog Day and you're like, why are we having the same talk? We've heard this over and over again. And I think other people, tend to get really uncomfortable when the term microaggressions gets uh, spoken. It's an uncomfortable topic. You don't know how to feel about it. And then there's a third group of people who are thinking, why should I care? This doesn't affect me. So I'm hoping to take all of you, put you all together and convince everyone that this is an important topic for every single person. The reason it's an important topic for every single person is first, we are all humans. Uh, we should care about other human beings, how other human beings are being treated. The other thing is, is despite some people's hesitation and thinking, well, I don't go through microaggressions, I'm actually gonna argue that no one really fits this cookie cutter mold of what a physician is supposed to be like, what they're supposed to act like, and microaggressions actually does affect all of us. We all took an oath to help people. So this is another reason why we should care about this topic. In our Hippocratic Oath, we took a an oath to do no harm. So doing no harm means being really well educated on really important social topics that are going on around you and keeping others from injustice was part of our Hippocratic Oath. So this really does affect every single physician, whether on the surface you believe that or not. And the truth is that in healthcare, so as a physician, you yourself, forget our patients, they go through a lot of inequalities, but you as a physician are going to, at some point in your life, experience inequality. The first inequality to talk about is something that's commonly spoken about. Um, women and people of color, minority persons, tend to still make dollar for dollar less money. So for controlling for all other factors, women make less money than men doing the same amount of work for the same amount of time. And that's exponentially um, true for people who are minorities. Women also, especially, we all know this now, this is very popular in the discussions of emergency medicine. Women tend to take the higher burden when it comes to childcare, which then also will affect their career, which will affect the amount of money they earn, so on and so forth. And depending on your minority or just the way that you look, you're going to get treated differently. You're going to have less opportunities given to you, depending again on the way that you look or the background that you come from. And if you identify as a trans person, all of this that we're talking about is magnified even to a higher level. Now you could even be this guy, be some, I don't know, Instagram famous veterinarian, and he looks kind of, I guess you can say picture perfect on screen, but even him, he's going to have microaggressions thrown at him because he's too pretty for a guy. Why is he take such good care of himself? 
Um, why does he spend so much time on himself? Does he really care about medicine if he has this other interest or is so into himself, right? So even if you are the perfect kind of, I don't know, picture perfect person, you're still going to get microaggressions thrown your way. So this really does affect everyone is my point. And in healthcare, we would like equality. Again, for our patients, we know that that's a fact that there are still a lot of inequalities out there, depending on who you are and what background you come from. So the goal is moving everyone towards equality. And now that I've hopefully gotten some of your buy-in in terms of why this is an important topic and it really will affect everyone. And even if it doesn't affect you in this moment, you should care about how it affects other people. Um, let's go over the objectives of this lecture. So the first is we're gonna talk about what are microaggressions and how can you practically in the moment solve or resolve a microaggression. We are going to talk about what macroaggressions are. And again, how can we actually as a single person attack macroaggressions and solve the problem? And my goal is to give you practical tools so that you walk out of here and on your next shift, if you see or if something is directed at you, you have an idea on how to approach it. Okay, so let's talk about microaggressions. That's the focus of the lecture, the majority of the lecture. So microaggressions are defined as brief everyday exchanges that send denigrating messages to certain individuals. To put it in plain terms, it's basically like you're in an episode of Mean Girls and people are just kind of shouting hidden insults or saying things that are really uncomfortable around you and you don't really know how to react. So let's go over common microaggressions and then after we'll go over solutions. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> So the first microaggression is that women and people of color and younger looking physicians tend to have their orders questioned a lot more by the nursing and ancillary staff than other people. So you order some uh, standard medication. I don't know, Zofran on a pregnant woman. And your nurses go, are you sure you wanna give that? And then they go around maybe to another provider who's not actually even taking care of the person and ask them, is it okay that this physician actually ordered this? And while everyone may go through this, I think especially I'm in the New York academic area, it's a very different nursing physician relationship. This definitely happens more to women, more to people of color and to younger looking or just younger physicians. And it makes the work environment a lot harder if all of your questions are being, if all of your orders are being questioned. So women get labeled as bossy when they are assertive, men just get labeled as the boss. And then if you're a woman, if you're a person of color, if you are trans, people just don't think you are the boss. And everyone knows the example of you walk into the room and depending on the way that you look, you're not assumed to be the attending, right? Um, you are, the, they look to the medical student who is tall, maybe older looking, and they're assumed to be the one in charge and not you. And again, this is for anyone who's, you know, woman, minority, trans, uh, someone that just doesn't fit whatever this cookie cutter mold is that society thinks of us. Now you can get labeled inaccurately on the same vein as something like nurse. Nothing wrong with being a nurse, but you're a physician, you're not a nurse. Um, my black colleagues uh, say a lot of times they get mislabeled as janitor or x-ray tech. Nothing wrong with those, uh, with those positions, but it's a little uncomfortable when despite being introducing yourself to others as physician, you get mislabeled as the wrong title. So this is a little cartoon of mansplaining, um, but this, this happens in a lot of different, it's a colloquial term, this happens in a lot of different realms where people think that you don't understand because you are, again, you're not fitting into this cookie cutter mold and they inappropriately dumb down and explain things that don't need to be explained to you. This happens a lot to my black colleagues, a lot to women, um, and a lot of times to younger physicians or people who just appear younger, but are actually super knowledgeable. So people can sometimes call you sweetie, which is not appropriate. That's not your term unless you have that relationship. Um, my man is a common one that men will get called. Um, not again, not appropriate, not your term. You didn't ask for it. It makes you uncomfortable. And for the women out there who might think that, you know, if you don't have kids, a lot of these problems might not happen to you. 
just by having a uterus, decisions are being made about you and you are missing out on opportunities because you identify or you you are you identify as a female. You look like a female. So when you go for a job interview, what can happen is they're looking at you and they're thinking, huh, okay, this woman, she looks like and she's in her 30s. I'm looking at her history of where she's worked. Maybe she's going to have kids. And this might be conscious or this might be subconscious, but this is well documented in the scientific literature that it happens. She might have kids. Maybe she's not going to be, her head's not going to be in it. Maybe she's not the person for this position because she's going to be busy with her life, which is completely unfair for many reasons. We're not going to sit here and lament. We're going to go on to a solution based approach here. But you're going to be passed up for different jobs and people will make assumptions about you just because you have a uterus, whether or not you want to have kids, you want to lean out of medicine or whatnot. And wearing religious symbols is something that still boggles my mind or certain symbols out there make people very uncomfortable to this day and it makes them act differently towards you, which they shouldn't. Um, if you are Jewish, if you follow the Islamic faith and you have symbols that show that it can make people very uncomfortable. They don't know how to act around you. They say some very uncomfortable comments. Apparently in 2021, a black fist is really controversial, which is just mind boggling. And I've even heard from some of my uh, colleagues that tampons and periods, the, those words make people very uncomfortable and they don't know how to respond when they hear them. Um, and they can distance themselves from other people because of it. It's very strange, but again, there's a lot of symbols out there that make people uncomfortable and treat you differently because of it. An example of a symbol that's very obvious that will definitely get you treated differently is if you wear religious garments, like, like a turban, like a hijab, like a kippah. These are all things that can definitely have microaggressions uh, pointed at you at a higher rate. Um, this one is something that I'll admit I didn't really know about until I looked into this topic and I guess I became older and more woke, if you want to use that term. Uh, can I call you something else? So when people don't want to learn how to say your name, um, it's actually a slight insult, right? So this happens, I think, a lot to minority persons. I go by Dr. A just because it makes my life more simple to not have to say my name 15 times to people. But um, a lot of my other colleagues, like I have a colleague, her last name is Odufanati, for example, and people don't want to take the time to learn how to say Odufanati. Can I call you something else? No, it's like what, six, eight letters? You can learn how to say that the same way you learn how to say any other last name that's out there or first name. So that's actually another microaggression is when people don't want to use your name or they say, we already have a doctor, um, I don't know, Chang, can I call you something else? No, my name is Dr. Chang. It doesn't matter that there's another Dr. Chang, my name is Dr. Chang, right? And then actually your shifts and your actual work that you do can be affected based off who you are. So I've been uh, told in doing these sessions and learn from other colleagues that, for example, um, there was a black physician, she worked a locum's job and the staffing person said, oh, I've got the best place for you. You're gonna be so happy. And they put her in the black neighborhood just because she's black. And while that might not seem like a microaggression on the surface, she didn't want to be in that neighborhood. It was a much longer commute for her from where she was going to be staying at. And there were a lot of other reasons why that didn't work for her. The schedule was not going to be as appealing. Like I said, it was a longer commute. She didn't know anyone there. She had friends in a different area. So this is another example of a microaggression where people assume different things based off the way you look and you're kind of getting the short end of the stick. Mentor opportunities are actually very unequal depending on how you look and who you are. So there was a famous study in the Journal of Medicine, I believe it was two years ago that was published, and they looked at people in leadership. So this was in business and in medicine, not just in medicine. And what it showed is that 74% of males in leadership positions, so higher ups like CEOs, CMOs, chair people, they felt uncomfortable mentoring female physicians. So that's a unnerving statistic for a couple different reasons, right? If 
you're on the top and you're not willing to help bring people up around you if it makes you uncomfortable, then the people down there are going to have less opportunities to rise. Um, the study went into talking about how this was really during the Me Too era and that probably had an effect. And yes, it doesn't just look at medicine, but the point is, is that people are actually saying they're uncomfortable mentoring people who are different than them. Okay, so I spoke about problems and I promise this is not supposed to be just a session where we talk about problems and it's the same thing over and over. I want us to now focus and move forward and talk about solutions. What you can do in the moment if you're the target of a microaggression or what you can do if you see a colleague around you being the target of a microaggression. So the first thing is, is everyone here needs to be willing to look inwards and to admit that they have probably microaggressed someone at one point or another. Inadvertently, you probably didn't mean it, but you have probably performed a microaggression towards someone else. And you have to be willing moving forward to accept that it might happen again. And if it does, you should correct yourself in the moment if you happen to perform a microaggression. None of us, it doesn't matter who you are, the color of your skin, your sex, we have all been wrong and we have to be willing to first accept that and accept that we will make change and we will do better moving forward. Before we even get into things to do when you're on the job, what you can do from the beginning is try to pick a good job where you're less likely to experience this sort of hostile work environment. So when you're on interviews, there's questions that you can ask to pick up subtle red flags about the environment that you're going to work in. If you're, for example, going to, you're moving from the big city and you're going to move into this small town and everyone there grew up in this small town and everyone knows each other, um, what you probably wanna be asking, again, it doesn't matter what you look like or who you are, what are the opportunities? Who are the people that are in charge? How do they make the schedule, right? Is there gonna be preferential treatment for all the people who are all friends with each other and you're just not gonna get as good shifts? Um, the people who rise up into leadership tend to be the people who are friends with each other, right? So there, there's different ways that you can ask these questions on the interview trail. You can ask to speak to physicians who are there that maybe are what we call like others, so not who fit whatever mold we're talking about, and ask them about their experience. But the first thing you can do, the best thing you can do is screen to have a good job, a place where you don't feel like you're going to have trouble working. There's lots of females, there's lots of young staff, there's lots of older staff, whatever problem you feel that you tend to encounter, screen for that when you're going on interviews. The next is when you are new somewhere, introduce yourself. Say, hi, I'm Dr. Adam Ackes. I'm the new, whatever your title is, I'm one of the new attendings here. It's nice to meet you. What's your name? And it seems a little bit tiring, but after a month, you're gonna be fine. But you're moving in on someone else's new turf and it's a great idea to set the tone, set the tone right from the beginning and introduce yourself to the staff around you so they have an easier time knowing that you're a person and you just wanna work great with others and they start to build that relationship with you and you're less likely to have issues working with people. This one is controversial and it comes up a lot in the discussions when I give these lectures is you really, for most people, you should be referring to yourself as doctor. So hi, I'm Dr. A. It's nice to meet you. And when you use, when you call yourself doctor, call other people around you doctor. So when you're in the charting area, your patients, most of us work in a fishbowl environment, not somewhere where patients can't see us. They're watching, they're listening. So refer to your colleagues when people are around watching and listening to you as doctor. So it's Dr. Howie, it's Dr. Schiller, it's Dr. Egan, it's Dr. A, it's not Frasso and Josh and Dan. You wanna create this culture around you where physicians are referred to as physicians because that way your nurses will be more likely to treat you with respect. Your patients will be more likely to treat you with respect. And you're gonna work in an environment where you and your other colleagues don't have an issue with people not knowing who you are and not respecting you. And when people don't know how to say your name, don't wanna learn how to say your name, can I call you something else? My name is, so my first name is Frasso and I've had a lot of times, do you have a nickname? Can I call you something else? No, 
sorry, my name is Frasso. It's six letters. I know you can learn how to say my name. So don't be shy to politely and friendly, but firmly uh, you make people learn how to say the name that you want them to say. This one I learned from a colleague, so, and it's a common term that's used, is you want to create a contract of respect. So this, what I'm about to talk about, I think really affects every emergency medicine physician. So let's say you call a consult and the person on the other line, this has never happened to any of us, the person on the other line is angry for no particular reason. Um, again, if you're young, if you're female, if you're new, they don't know you, maybe you're getting more attitude than your colleagues would over the phone. Or maybe this person is just an angry human being and they're giving you a lot of trouble. What you can do in the moment to handle the situation better, because I know we've all been in situations where you have a difficult interpersonal encounter and you walk away going, you know, I wish I handled that better. I wish I did X, Y, Z, said X, Y, Z in the moment and you kind of lament over how you wish you handled that differently. So these are examples of how. What you wanna do is create a contract of respect. So you are talking to Dr. Smith on the phone. Dr. Smith, we're both professionals. I'd like us to have a professional conversation. Our focus is the patient's well-being. So moving forward, I'd really like us to keep that in mind that we're focused on the patient's well-being. And I'd like this conversation to remain professional. And when you set the tone like that and you use words like professional and it's the patient who's, who's important here, it usually makes people snap back and no one wants to act unprofessional. We are professionals. And it usually makes them fall in line. And then the second that they start to raise their voice again, get inappropriate, say, Dr. Smith, we spoke about this. We're professionals and we need to continue to have a professional conversation here. And you hold them accountable throughout the whole conversation. So set the tone early on when you notice something's not going right. So recruit allies around you. If you are new somewhere and you notice that um, there are other, there's men who seem comfortable helping you or are willing to stand up for you, recruit them around you. I had a situation once where uh, it was a clerk who just doesn't know how to make jokes and he makes kind of these uncomfortable sexual jokes to women. He does, he really doesn't mean it. He's a really nice guy. I think he's just very awkward, but it's uncomfortable to be on the receiving end of them, especially as a physician and him being a clerk. So I thought about the different ways to handle it. And I went to another male clerk who I knew was young and was understanding of the situation. He knows this guy can do this. And I said, hey, can you do me a favor? He's making those weird jokes that he does and it's actually really uncomfortable. Can you talk to him at some point today? Not right now. Um, it's just it's just getting a lot and it's uncomfortable. And you know what? I didn't have a problem after that. So I recruited an ally. I recruited someone who I knew was comfortable and was willing to help me. And I had them help me in the situation. I could have done it myself, but when I looked at my different options, I thought that in this particular situation, this was the best approach. And when I talk about allyship, I talk about it, not again, not just for women, right? There's a lot of different groups, a lot of different people who you can just lean to other people to help you if you feel like it's necessary in that moment. It really helps when everyone is on the same page, helping each other. And then if in doubt, if you're trying all of these things, you're trying to be nice and you're asking for help from others, you're still having trouble with someone, sometimes you can just call them out. And it's, Oh, you can do this in a professional manner that doesn't make people very uncomfortable, but it just points things out to people. So for example, you overhear a nurse calling a Dr. Gonzalez. She's so bossy. God, you know, in that code, she was just so bossy. What you can do, even though you're not Dr. Gonzalez, is say, hey, you know, that's actually really interesting. I was reading this article recently and what it said is that when women are in positions of leadership, they tend to get labeled as bossy. But when it's a man, we just think they're a boss. And when you brought that point out about Dr. Gonzalez, it actually gave me that example because I know she's super cool and you and I know she's super cool. And she was probably just trying to lead the code, right? But I bet you if it was a tall older guy, none of us would bat an eyelash. So I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. So that's kind of a way that you can professionally call someone out, 
not make them too uncomfortable. And you talk about the topic and you move on so that it, it doesn't just become a thing throughout the rest of the day. You stop, you address the microaggression and you move forward. Now, some of you are thinking, I've thought of these things, but I'm never good at thinking about it in the moment, right? Like I discussed. So I am a really big proponent on mental simulation. I think we do this a lot for different scenarios. I'm sure I'm not the only one who thinks about what happens when I'm on the train, if someone passes out um, and comes up with ways that I'm gonna handle the situation. I know I'm not the only one. Why don't we do this for interpersonal relationships, for interpersonal conflict, for issues that come up in the workplace? So um, a lot of people, and I started doing this definitely, is I try to be proactive. On my commute, I'm taking a shower, I think about, okay, what if I had this nurse who I know is difficult, give me trouble like this? How could I respond to it? And I run different scenarios in my head. Um, and you can do this in a lot of different scenarios for a lot of different things. And then sometimes, let's say I haven't pre-thought about how to handle some scenario, something new comes my way. What I'll do is I'll take a second, I'll go to my computer, I'll take a breath so I'm not angry, and I think about different ways that I can handle the scenario. And then I'll pull the person aside or, you know, I'll handle it in whatever way I think is, is doable. But I think running simulations and practicing things in your head before you say them is a really great approach. We do it for medicine. I don't know why we don't do it for interpersonal relationships. It's good to do with your partner too. I've heard a lot of colleagues when I give this lecture say, you know what? I'm not confrontational. I just wanna walk away. Is that okay? Yes, it's totally okay. If you really don't want to deal and the microaggressions truly don't bother you, you don't have to confront everyone every single time. But I'm going to challenge you that if you really look down and think deep down, microaggressions by their nature, they usually bother the person that it's targeted at. So by ignoring it, you're not really, you're not solving the problem and it's only gonna get worse. So I really encourage you to think first, does this bother you? Is it something you should address? And then find an approach that works for you, right? The direct confrontation might not work for you and that's totally fine, but experiment with this. And rather than saying you don't care, maybe think about how you would solve it that works for you. Because most of us don't wanna feel like we're just walking out of our shift and it doesn't matter if the whole place blows up. I know we joke around and we say that term, but most of us want to leave a place, even if we're on our way out and we're, we're quitting, we're you know, going somewhere else, most of us wanna leave a place better off than the way it was when we were there. So I challenge you to really keep this in mind, even if you're at a temporary job, it, it is important to help change the environment that's around you. Because this is a time investment. When I'm, I've heard people say, yes, but every time I deal with a microaggression, it takes time. Yes, but everything that we do in life takes a little bit of time. And the purpose is, is upfront, you invest time and effort, and then it's going to make the rest of your career a lot easier. So by learning how to deal with microaggressions, if you haven't felt like you were able to handle them when they were targeted at you, or when you see it happen around you, by practicing, this is gonna become second nature, and you're not gonna be thinking, and it's not gonna be work later on at this, this job, at another job, this is all gonna become a lot easier. So instead of thinking about how much work this is, think of this as an investment to your long-term career and to helping those around you. And I don't want to hear that I'm just one person, I can't change, you can, you know, we all, and I know it, it feels a little bit cheesy to be pulling quotes, but it's true. One person can change things around them. We all know people in history, we all know personal examples of one person just being a little bit more outspoken and a little bit more persistent and making really good change around them. So you can make change even if you're only one person. And I'm going to challenge you and say you're probably not the only person who wants to do better at this stuff. Okay, so we went over what microaggressions are, some examples, and we went over some practical solutions. I'm going to talk briefly about what macroaggressions are. So macroaggressions are large scale systemic oppressions of target groups. So think big problems, that, it's a problem with society and with the system. So an example of that is something that I mentioned early on when I was trying to get your buy-in, is the fact that, doesn't forget medicine, 
women just get paid less than men dollar for dollar uh, accounting for every other factor and again this happens to minority persons as well to an exponential degree the fact that we have no parental no federal parental leave in the united states is actually a, micro, a macro aggression because all and and it is something that affects everyone because although it's you know we think typically it's women who get the short end of the stick here by not having a federal parental leave, what's happening is that men aren't given the opportunities to be the dads they want because there's no system set in place to allow them to spend time with their family. Um, again, it's not set for women either, but if we're not focusing on parental leave, men are also being affected. And by and even if you're like, well, I don't want to have kids, again, by not having a system that's understanding that's willing to help people and support people very temporarily when they need it, what happens is we have a country where we don't care about anyone. We're so individualistic that we're never willing to support anyone. So even if you're not gonna have kids, God forbid, at some point in your life, something is gonna happen to you that you can't function at 100% superhuman uh, speed that you're functioning at right now. We know about burnout, we know about depression, you can go rock climbing. I have a friend who went rock climbing, uh, indoor rock climbing in Brooklyn and broke, broke both of their ankles and had bilateral trimal fractures and needed surgery, right? These are just freak accidents that could happen to anyone. Cancer can happen to anyone. Aging is going to happen to everyone, right? So we need to create a system where we're more understanding when people need a tiny bit of support because this issue actually affects everyone. So I wrote sexual harassment, is comments, isms. What this basically means is that sexism still exists, racism still exists, ageism still exists. So either you're too young to do the job, you're too old to do the job. Um, heteronormativity, when we talk about couples, we assume there's a mom and dad. Whenever we talk about couples, we don't uh, include conversations that open up for um, the LGBTQ community, right? So we just have this environment where a lot of these topics are still taboo. And the people who tend to succeed in our country, we're talking about systemic issues, the people who tend to succeed in businesses and countries, in hospitals, the people that are at the top, top of the food chain, they tend to look and act all a certain way. Um, what happens is we have this VIP club, like I spoke about, where if you don't fit into whatever this group thinks, um, you know, they're all friends, they all, they are all, whether it be white, whether it be black, whether it be male, female, or just from this little town, and you're not from this little town, you're not going to succeed. They're not going to invite you to the table to make the big decisions. They're not definitely not going to be pushing you to have you promoted to be a leader and um, it creates a lot of inequalities in your workplace. And again, this is a systemic problem. It's not unique to one institution. So why should I care? What are the solutions? What can you as a doctor who's busy do? So the first way to target systemic problems is just speak up when you say things. I think we've all been in situations where you walk away thinking, eh, I probably should have said something there, right? So if you see an inequality, speak up, speak out, move on. You don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but the more that we become allies to other people, the more that we create change in the world. And it does really start from one individual. So mentorship is really important. Um, everyone in court knows that the only way to move up in life is to seek out mentors. This is especially true for people who don't fit into whatever cookie cutter you're talking about, but lean on other people find people who are successful that you feel like you developed a little connection with and have them take you and bring you up with them. This is the best approach to help you improve in life. I know that if I didn't have my mentors, I definitely would not be where I am today. And I know everyone who's successful will say the exact same thing. Mentorship is key. Don't just speak up, but speak out. So give lectures be at the table where they're making really important decisions. The more that you represent and you start being part of organizations and committees on a local, regional, national level, the more that you help other people see that change is possible because you are the face of this small part of change. So it's possible for everyone. 
like I said before, allies are really important. Find allies wherever you are and become an ally to other people. This is important for women. This is important for minority persons. This is important for trans persons. This is really important for everyone. Or even the example I give where you're just new to the community, new to a hospital, and you need a little help navigating around to get in with the in crowd. And there are things literally on a systematic level that we can actually do. So ASAP and AEEM both have legislative days where um, even now during times of COVID and things were a little bit changed during COVID, where you can go and you can talk to Congress people. And as a physician, you can help implement change. This is set up in our big organizations. So why not take advantage of it? It uh, happens, it's not even a whole week, uh, once a year for ASAP, once a year for AAM. And these are great opportunities to get involved on a political level and be proud of the work that you're doing and actually create change. And most importantly, so I talk, I'm talking a lot about, you know, advocacy and you might think that I'm thinking everyone has to work full time and be super aggressive and get into politics and get into academics. That's not what I'm saying either. What I'm really trying to say is just find a path that works for you, be proud of it and do it really well. So if you want to be a leader in academics, great, go for it and represent. If you want to be a stay at home parent, be a stay at home parent because you are being an example for other people around you, showing them that it's okay to lean out and focus on your family sometimes. If you don't want to have kids and you want to travel the world and you want to work hard and play hard, be that person because again, you're showing people around you that there's not one way to do things, there's not one path to happiness. Because really, what this all boils down to is that we all just need to be happy. We all want to be happy in our jobs, in our personal lives, and throughout hopefully a long and successful career. So in summary, I hope that I've convinced you that no one really fits into this cookie cutter mold. So it's important to pay attention to these social topics that on the surface seem like only affect a few people. Inequality exists. We're hoping to change that and move towards equality by starting to tackle some of these issues. And the first way to do that is to look inwards and admit that you've been a problem in the past and you may cause, you may inadvertently be part of the problem moving forward, but be willing to accept that and be willing to make change when necessary. Microaggressions are brief everyday exchanges that send denigrating messages to certain individuals. Think about mean girls. Macroaggressions are large, sta large scale systemic oppression of target groups. So big issues that affect everyone across the country. Ways that we can challenge some of the microaggressions are introducing ourselves as doctor whenever we go somewhere, when we're working somewhere new. Ask for contracts of respect when you're working with people who are being disrespectful to you. I really think practice is the key and do mental simulations so that in the moment you're actually able to handle a situation and you don't walk away going, ah, you know, I wish I would have said something. And say enough is enough and confront people if problems get too much for you. For macroaggressions, I think the biggest way to make change in the world, even though you're one person, is develop mentorship relationships, have people lift you up, have them bring you to where you want to go, speak up and speak out, be part of movements that are around there and be allies to other people. And if it's right for you and you want, you can get involved really with legislative change. AEM and ASAP have great opportunities for that. So this was a solutions-based lecture and we're gonna open it up for questions now, but what I'm really talking about is resolution. We're hoping that these issues that I talk about will be resolved and there will be a future for future generations where people don't have to deal so much with these issues. And you, one person, can be the face of change. I'm one person, I've, de I've dealt with a lot of microaggressions in my life and I've made change around me. And so I really think, you know, if I can do it, if other people out there can do it, if you think about all the examples in the world, so can you. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope we have a fun discussion now. Um, and this is my contact information if you need anything. Thank you, Fraso. I think that was absolutely fantastic. Um, 
I have the chat room open. So if people want to stick questions in there or um, if at different points we want to unmike and um, have people ask things or comment. I think one of the comments that I have is um, uh, it's also important to think about what the intentionality of the micro or macroaggression is because macroaggressions are usually pretty intentional. But some of the microaggressions that suck away at our energy um, don't always have the intentionality behind them that we think they do. So, you know, the common thing of, um, hey nurse, whenever I walk into the room because I'm female can get to be very frustrating. But the reality is that the patient, there's a lot of people that are walking in and out of the room. I introduced myself as doctor. However, I understand 10 more people have walked in the room since I was there before. So one of the ways that I've turned that around is I correct it not with, oh, I'm a doctor, but I correct it with, you know, I want you to know who sees you. And it's important for you to know that uh, I don't want you to go home without thinking you weren't seen by the doctor because I am a doctor. Um, and then we go on from there. And so it, it's kind of the tie into like educating a patient who is unfortunately making an assumption based on whatever their background is. Um, and, uh, and without the anger I think I had when I was younger, when that kept coming up. Um, and I think that that's been the very effective way for me to turn it around. Um, anybody else have questions or comments? Not sure if I can get the raise hand mode. Um, Marianne, I was going to just um, piggyback on that. I'm, I'm doing this course with the ACGME and one of the segments we had the other day was on this. And um, that came up and I, we're going to have a session next week with our residents about kind of the unintentional um, microaggressions that people can, can um, you know, do every day. But the, the phrase that they used in this course um, was impact, not intent. And that like just resonated with me very much along the lines of what you just said, that it's not always the intentional ones, but the impact of those unintentional things is, is harmful. And so to really, um, to think of it from that perspective. So I totally agree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I see from Caroline, she said, uh, great points for addressing microaggression. How do you address if residents go around one of the leaders of the program uh, who's Hispanic and female and go to another leader, male and white? Yes, great, the runaround game. And I'm, I'm going to assume that, well, it doesn't even matter if they're on the same level. So, Again, I think the context, this is a conversation that we can definitely have offline and parse out more. That's totally inappropriate. That should not happen. I would probably talk to my colleagues and see what they said and why they think maybe they went around you. Hopefully you're working with a team who supports you and realizes the inappropriate nature of that resident's action. And once I get a little bit more background information, I personally would approach the resident and say, hey, listen, um, and maybe this is a resident that you guys just don't click with, right? There's, you're never going to click with everyone. I would say, hey, listen, you know, I know we were having this issue or I know this issue came up, but I'm really the point person or, you know, I didn't appreciate it when you went around me to someone else. I know you were just trying to resolve your issue, but let's stay in our lanes. Let's follow hierarchy and I'm here to help you. So I would kind of, I guess the term I like to use is, politely, professionally, maybe even with a little bit of a smile, because I find it helps me um, address the issue. I would not let it go. And I would start first, though, by talking to my colleagues and seeing what they thought of the situation, why it happened, and get their buy-in so they're supportive. I don't know if anyone else has comments, because I don't think there's one right answer here. So I think one of the things that I find interesting in that interaction is um, asking why. So even before we kind of say that, you know, we're the point person, um, really in a quiet space, um, have a real conversation of why is it that you felt you needed to go in that direction? What, what in the path of our conversation previously led you to believe that that was the right path? Um, and, you know, as part of the conversation, um, as part of the conversation, it ends up being um, truly maybe looking into 
uh, I know that I personally can come across a little strong when I'm uh, talking about something. And it may be something where it would be redirecting the way that I'm coming across. But the reality is also allowing that person to understand that their path in choosing to um, not address it directly with the person who was talking about it with them to start with uh, actually ends up diminishing their respect in your eyes and that you don't respect them as much. And was that their intention? Because that's concerning, obviously, as you go forward into the professional environment further. I think that's a great approach, a great tip. I think Carmen is saying, great lecture. How would you address when you point out the problem it gets dismissed by your leadership and they label you as a pouncer. I, I'm not sure that I know what pouncer means, Carmen. So feel free to jump in to talk about it. Does anybody- I'm gonna think that's the same thing as like bossy. Like you're a complainer, you're oh, gonna pounce on okay. every problem, you're bossy, okay. whatever term. Um, so that's challenging for many reasons. I wonder, is there one person in leadership? Is there someone? And whether, you know, it depends where in leadership we're talking about. There's chairperson, there's program director, APD. I would try to find someone in leadership who would be your ally, who can support you on this, or even another attending, if it's not in leadership, who would support you and um, help bolster and help you approach this issue. If you are getting completely dismissed, you can say, I understand that this is not I can see that you don't think this is an issue, but I'm telling you it's an issue for me. Um, for me, that's a huge red flag. If I'm really not being heard at all or supported, I don't know if you're willing to or open to leave. You know, leaving is always an option. Um, and it depends what the issue is. You know, maybe get HR involved. I learned recently, I think we're so in academics wanting to mentor and take care of people sometimes getting HR involved actually solves the problem. We had this big issue once, we got HR and it just like went away. It was magical. And I thought it was gonna make it a bigger issue. So sometimes going down um, the HR route can be helpful. Again, we can kind of email and chat separately unless you wanna talk about more details. Um, I don't think it should go away and I definitely think it should still be addressed. Um, and it should be noted that you are not a pouncer, you are not a problem person. This is just a problem that needs to be resolved and you're asking for support and respect. I'd love to hear other people's uh, comments because this is not, that's not an easy one. Carmen says, thank you. Anybody else with any other questions or comments? Fraso, I really want to thank you uh, for talking about this. I think um, I've done some stuff on microaggressions as well and seeing it from, oh, wait, there's one new message. Hold on. Maybe there's another question in there. Uh, great feedback, says Carolyn. Okay. Um, so uh, to see it from the solutions point of view, I think is a great way to approach this. I think that um, recognizing the micro and macroaggressions can be um less challenging now, and especially now that we have names for these, uh, anything from slights to outright aggression um, is super helpful, but I love the solutions approach to this. I think that's, that's really helpful. Thanks, Marianne. All right, well, I wanna thank everybody for coming. Um, as Tina said at the beginning, this uh, has been recorded and will be up on the website. Uh, I really wanna thank, um, besides Frost, I wanna thank Dan Egan, who um, is uh, my co-leader in this. And I really appreciate all his efforts and work as well as Tina who pulls it all together so that everybody can actually see this happen. So thank you to both of you guys as well as to Frasso for joining us for a talk uh, and our next talk, I'm sorry, as I'm looking at the date, is going to be on October 28th. So keep your calendars open, look for the invitation and the information, and uh, we look forward to having people come back uh, and see the next talk. Thanks so much. Thank you again, Frasso. Thanks everyone for coming. Bye.